What did you think was going to happen when that door opened? Or are you all just chewing? Because that could also be a thing. Um, how's it going? Who's here for the first time ever? Whoa. Okay, so extra special welcome to the green space. I'm Jennifer. I work here. And I'm glad that you're all with us tonight, um, especially if you're coming for the first time. And I hope you'll come back again and you'll enjoy what you see here. So then the rest of you have been here before? Yeah, cool. Okay, so fair amount, fair amount. So I'll tell you a little bit about the space. So the green space is part of New York Public Radio. Do you guys listen to the radio? It's still a thing. Okay, still a thing. So we're part of the company that owns WNYC, WQXR, which is a classical music station. We make a lot of podcasts here, like Radio Lab and On the Media. And we have this space where we invite people to join us to make podcasts, make radio, and just make a lot of crazy stuff happen, like some Goya beans hanging from the ceiling. Um, it's never <laughs> happened before in this room, but I can't say it won't happen again because I'm really liking it. So, uh, so glad you're here. If you would take a moment to silence your phones before we get on with the show, that would be great because we are recording this show. We're streaming it online. You can share it with a friend. You can refer to it later, and it'll become a podcast because that's what the Mashup Americans do. Um, is anyone so into WNYC or WQXR that they are a member of? Whoa. All right, all right, all right. So we're listener supported. Some people think public radio is part of like a government agency or something like that, and it just simply is not. Everything, yeah, for better or worse, it simply is not. So um, people like you who like the work that we do are our biggest source of funding. It's how we make everything that we do, including events like this. So again, come back to the green space and think about being a member. Now, I have in this array of thanks, someone that we want to thank tonight who's going to come out and tell you a little bit more about the beer that I hope you all tried in the lobby. It is Julian Riley. He is the founder and owner of Harlem Brew Brewery, who's been donating beer for us here at the green space. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, everyone. I hope you had a chance to taste some Harlem Blue. I didn't expect to be addressing you from the stage, but I'm excited to do so. Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I really wanted to, what got me interested in Harlem Blue was we wanted to create, I wanted to share the love that I had for good beer and my community of Harlem. So that's where, where it all started. I also was tired of uh, Brooklyn having all the fun. I thought we could do a little bit of that ourselves. Um, but uh, the, the impetus be behind Harlem Blue was that I wanted to broaden the category appeal of craft beer um, and diversify it a little bit more and reflect the Harlem and the New York City that I know and love. Um, so I think that there's a lot to the city that's not reflected in what was hipsters or whatever the stereotype of craft beer drinkers was at the time. Uh, I think that's changing a little bit, but that's still, still relevant for us. So that was really what it was. We call ourselves City Craft Beer for City Folks. Um, I would recommend that you guys take a look at our website and our social media, harlemblue.com, and uh, these lights are so bright, and, um, <laughs> and, uh, and our like, IG and social media is Harlem Blue Beer. Um, we got a cool blue light story. We've got two styles right now. We'll have more. We will be the first new brewery in Harlem since Prohibition, um, and that, uh, that notice will be coming out early in the new year, so if you're following us on social, you'll get that early and you'll be one of the cool people. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I'm excited about it. I, uh, I'm very committed to Harlem and really enjoy it, and I think that what br Harlem brings to the city is valuable and important, um, and I think that uh, we're at a time where we all need to be a little bit more community focused and sort of just appreciating that, and that's uh, really what we look for there. So um, look for us. Enjoy us. We're about fun and, and, and that community and enjoyment. So that's really what we're trying to stand for. So you'll see us engaged in a lot of different places in the city and uh, really excited and appreciative to be at the green space. So thank you. All right. Thanks, Julian. So tonight is all about celebrating local food, local food businesses. Hope you did get to check out all the vendors who are here. You're going to hear more about them during the show. So let's like get on with the show, right? Let's give it up for your hosts, Amy and Rebecca, the Mashup Americans. Okay, hold on. Okay, wait, hold on. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. We moan a lot. Cre that's krechsing. That's what they call it in Yiddish. <laughs> that's what? Krechsing. Oh, it I thought it was like what you'd think. Oh my god, I thought it was called being forty. 
three. Uh, sure, for being alive. Hi. <laughs> hey, cheers. Um. Mm -hmm. My God, look at you. That's my sister, you guys. She looks like a tiny version of me. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Amy. And I'm Rebecca, and we're the Mashup Americans. Oh my God, we are Woo! so excited. Thank you for coming. Uh, we are so excited to be here for our second program of our artist residency here at the Green Space, where they said they put the public in public radio. Which oh yeah. Really delighted us because we're this is the public facing piece and like people of Soho can see us right now. I know. Also, we never thought about that. And um, Ryan, one of our producers, said that the other day, and I actually screamed. Yeah. It was. Uh, it was good. We have a simple pleasure, yes. you guys. <laughs> um, so we basically designed our dream space here. Um, our twist and subversion of the ethnic aisle because our philosophy is um, we we are the whole grocery store mm -hmm. you we know are everything we are everywhere everything because why would we want to be segregated into a corner mm -hmm. though we do love that the ethnic aisle is usually you know asian kosher and hispanic which is <laughs> <laughs> yeah so we're like that's us we're i know here. it's pretty great but so we are so so happy we're all here we are so happy that we could have harlem blue hope you drink some beer taranga chat dogs uh chandra and demira from league of kitchens and burlap and barrel which yeah. um we have bought holiday presents from you've every probably year, so. some of you have received some uh -huh, from us correct. so uh. um but we are just uh you know, I think we have a lot of questions about what it means to be put in an ethnic aisle, why mm -hmm. it even exists. We learned it is because um, veterans coming back from World War II wanted to eat Italian, Japanese, and German foods. Yes. Mm -hmm. they, so so that's is. when the ethnic aisle started. Thank you to Priya Krishna of the New York Times for her excellent reporting there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then, but the, the interesting thing is that the uh, white people moved the, out. The, the European aisle. foods somehow made their way out of the ethnic aisle. So mm -hmm. we have some questions about that. Mm -hmm. I think we might also have answers. Yeah. I know. Well, that, we can uh, talk uh, about that later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But our philosophy is that culture and food and art are porous, that um, you can't put a fence around people and you can't put a fence around ideas. And I think one of the things that we learned from uh, Chef Pierre Tiam, who is one of the co-founders of Taranga, um, is that, you know, what it what it means to eat food and learn somebody else's story, mm. that food is a story, that that food helps gather us, connect us, and help us be in community. Um, we love to and are very humbled to sit at the foot of like incredible thinkers and leaders. And one of the things that moved us so much this year was our friend, the great organizer, Ai-jen Poo, said that love draws a circle around all of us together. And we think that food does too. So we're very happy to have a circle around all of us here today. And we've eaten some delicious food today. And also we've eaten a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I had to unzip my jacket. Yes. It was things were getting taught. <laughs> you know, we know who we are. <laughs> um, you know, and we've been thinking a lot, I, I'm sure there are many mashups in here about hospitality and what it means, like for us, for example, um, doing things cone class mm -hmm. uh, and like basically having at least 50% more food than uh then is required and if if there isn't 50 percent left it's over, very stressful you've made it no it's too little yeah you've made yeah. It a tactical error yeah in you what have you're doing there better here. be cool whip containers mm -hmm. or whatever filled with you know sp turmeric stained foods and yeah. <laughs> that's the way we that's the way we roll and you know even the word taranga which we learned from pierre is uh, the wolof word that means hospitality and so many of us mashups that's how we do my 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 family i think it's almost like competitive hospitality mm. it's like you know going hard that's how we take care of each other so we hope that you think of yourselves as in our in our family with mm -hmm. us tonight and um you know we're thinking about the context of the ethnic aisle we're thinking about uh community and and also going out and bringing people up with us mm -hmm. right do you want to give them like our stats of mashup america oh yeah okay so <laughs> just for some context about the mashup americans some familiar faces and some new ones here you know we run a creative studio where we make original content and we work with wonderful clients as well to make content about race, culture, identity, and what it means to be American today. Um, from the less 
thinking not about binaries, but about the range of the ways that you can mash up, being deeply rooted and also looking forward to the future. And of course, I do have an MBA, so I think it's important to come with stats. Um, and just I don't to, have an MBA. You know, that's no. why we're good partners. Uh, so I think, you know, the first time just for you, to use multiracial as a proxy for what mashiness is, although it's just one way of seeing it, um, it was only on the census for the first time in the year 2000. And so between 2000 and 2010, there was a 32% growth of people who identified as multiracial. And between 2010 and 2020, there was a 276% growth in that same population. So, you know, even in, in, in New York City, for example, the 1.4 million more people identified as, as multiracial, multiracial that in 2020 versus 2010. Um, so just some context for the world and the world we're swimming in. Uh, and 67 million Americans speak a language other than English at home. And by 2045, more U.S. population, the U.S. will become majority non-white. So that's, that's where we're coming from. We're coming. And we are optimistic about that future, even despite the ways things sometimes feel like the world is not. Uh, is the garbage trash bag. That's correct. Yes. I think that was. The, that that, that the, the professional term. I believe yeah. that's mm -hmm. the sociological history. official. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so with that, we are excited to talk to some po beautiful human beings who are making culture in, in New York City right mm -hmm. now. And so I want to introduce you to Licia Kyung Gross. Um, she is the founder and CEO of League of Kitchens, a culturally immersive cooking experience where immigrant women like Damira and Chandra um, mm -hmm. teach their family recipes. <laughs> Woo! Um, Savure has called League of Kitchens the multicultural cooking school you have been waiting for, and you can, you know, maybe for your holidays, you can give that as a gift. So, welcome, Lisa. Woo! Uh, hello, welcome. Hi. How you doing? Great. Okay, good. <clears throat> Thank you for having me. It makes Lisa a little uncomfortable, but we feel that she is, if we could make children together, who it would be. <laughs> <laughs> Even that, to the hair and the dimples. <laughs> totally, yeah. It's like a lot. You no. Can, not for nothing. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. Lisa Kyung Gross. Yeah, she is, she is us. <laughs> so anyway, we're excited about that. <laughs> Sorry to make everyone Ooh, else well, uncomfortable. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. They're here. Everybody's stuck in our circle now. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Lisa, how do you mash up? Well, as you guys alluded to, <laughs> my mother's Korean. Uh, she immigrated here in the early 1970s. Mm -hmm. My dad, she was a nurse like my mom. Yes, it's mm -hmm. true. Um, my dad is born in New York City. Um, his family are Hungarian Jews who came to New York in like the 1890s to 1910s. Um, so definitely uh, Hungarian Jewish, Korean, one side, first generation American, one side, like fourth generation New Yorker. Um, oh. So love. Yeah. Well, you also have a wonderful story that I would like you to share about your mother's kimbap. Yes, we were just talking about this before the show that uh, my parents met in graduate school and on an early date, my mom brought gimbap to the date because they were going on an outing. And if you guys are unfamiliar, gimbap is like Korean. I want to say, I hate saying Korean sushi. No. Because it's not. Mm -mm. It's not. But it's, it has rice It's and rice seaweed. with seaweed. And then there are lots of delicious fillings. And it's traditionally like a picnic food or like a lunch food or you're going out on an outing kind of food. So my mom brought this on their date. And my dad was like, whoa. I think I'm gonna marry this woman. Yes, <laughs> but that's also because yeah. So my dad is a Jewish American man who's like very anxious about eating and having <laughs> enough food and gets very hungry. So it was like she understood him and met that need to always have snacks. I mean, so <laughs> I, I mean, just, what more I do you like need? This right? is a literal match made in heaven. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Anticipating someone's snack needs. You know, sure. my parenting book <laughs> that I have written in my head is called Parenting Through Snacks. Yeah. And it's a philosophy that I'm happy to share mm -hmm, with all mm -hmm. of you. We're going to save some of these for later. <laughs> so what's your comfort food? You know, I go both Korean and Jewish with this. So I would say my home comfort food is probably um, denjangkuk, which mm -hmm. is like a soybean paste soup with rice and kimchi or like maybe some other banchan mm -hmm. that I've made or bought. Um, but always I also bought, always bought. 
Um, I do run a cooking school, so That's I try true. to cook. <laughs> I will buy from your people. Okay. Yes, okay. Um, but I also actually love chopped liver. Oh. Yeah. And cho- yeah, and I would have that with my Jewish grandmother a lot. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I love all the like weird Jewish food, like gefilte fish yeah, and know, pickled too. herring yes. and chopped well, liver. I have a question. Yeah. It's so yeah. that this is um, my husband is sitting right here delightful person right there but with our children who are eight and ten and I know yours are six, six and, nine, and nine yeah so I feel when you say Teng Jung Guk, like I feel this weird sense of victory when my children want to eat Korean food and not like rice and beans yeah I feel like I won <laughs> a competition and I know that that's probably not healthy but I would love to know what your children like to eat yeah and are you winning yeah uh, <laughs> well one thing is my kids don't like soup which I can't, oh! like, get with. Oh, sorry, was that so loud? <laughs> oh, my God. And actually, one funny aside is my mom said there's this Korean saying that if you love soup, you'll marry a good husband. <laughs> and oh, she there lies! Is, there is so, always a saying. Which is funny. So she, and she loves soup. So she's like, see? Oh, yeah. It worked. So I'm like, what does this mean? That my kids don't like soup. <laughs> I, I mean, those it's things that get stuck in there. Yes, yes, it's yes. very inauspicious. Um, but uh, my younger daughter, she won't touch vegetables. However, mm. she loves seafood. Mm-hmm. She loves natto. She loves, like, liver. She loves um, uh, meduchi, like, tiny, mm-hmm. you know, crunchy um, anchovies. So... Yeah, she's very, she's sort of weirdly conventional in certain ways as a kid that she won't touch vegetables, but then she loves like fish and those foods. And then my older daughter. Yeah, no, sort of. And then my, out. and she loves like um, salmon roe, like uh, we call, she calls them pop eggs. Mm-hmm. She eats them mm-hmm. on rice. Um, and then my older daughter loves vegetables. Um, and they, they both, love, and she loves kimchi. She loves spicy food. They actually, they, and I think, one cool thing for them with me running the League of Kitchens for their entire lives, like mm-hmm. literally I was pregnant with my older daughter when we launched, is they eat, you know, they're exposed to a mm-hmm. ton of foods from all over the world, most of which they'll try. But I'd say their favorite food is actually Mexican food. Yeah. Rice and beans. Rice and beans. <laughs> as a, it's always as there. A, it's just always there. As a <laughs> Los Angeles supremacist, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense for me. I, yeah. I mean, it is really perfect food. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we, we're, you know, we've said we're thinking a lot about hospitality and what that looks like, and you've built this business, and you know how to create that. But, like, what does hospitality mean to you? Yeah, well, that's definitely something that our instructors are, like, the best at the world, in the world at, you know, like, a huge, so a huge part of our model is that our cooking classes take place in our instructors' homes. Mm -hmm. So you sign up for a class on our website, you can go to Demira's apartment in Borough Park and learn how to cook Uzbek food, you can go to Chandra's apartment in East Helmhurst and cook Indonesian food with her, and, like, they, like, you're talking with your family, like, they are so loving and gracious and generous and just like welcome literally strangers because people Mm -hmm. just sign up on our website they're open to welcoming groups of strangers multiple times a month into their homes cooking a ton of food serving a ton of food when people arrive having way more food than anyone can eat and that's the only way yeah it is of course and um it's just it's really inspiring like every time i go to one of their homes i'm just sort of bowled over by the warmth of their hospitality and their generosity. And I think also, you know, so many of them are from cultures that have this very strong hospitality culture. Like we have a lot of instructors from the Middle East, Central Mm -hmm. Asia, um, you know, Mexico, Indonesia. I mean, basically every every culture culture basically has hospitality culture, right? Uh, But I think it's it can be different in the U.S., Mm -hmm. right? Like. And I think that's one of the pleasures of going to our classes as you're just like immersed in this deeply loving, generous hospitality culture. Has it changed? How do you feel like League of Chicken, League of Chickens? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, the kitchen chicken thing, it's always a challenge. <laughs> this is why we have editors. Um, how do you feel that League of Kitchens has changed you? Like experiencing that kind of yeah. love and that kind of abundance? I mean, I 
personally feel so grateful that I know our 14 instructors and they know my mm-hmm. kids and my kids know them and they're we it's like a family like they're all friends we've been in existence now for close to 10 years and um, it just brings so much joy and love into mm-hmm. my life I mean I feel like I'm the luckiest person because I get to hang out with all of them all the time and cook with them and eat with them and go to their homes and mm-hmm. I was wondering um, actually I have a question about yeah. like what kind of kibitzing gossiping happens? In the <laughs> well, are one there thing... like alliances? <laughs> Demira, <laughs> Chandra, you can chime in. <laughs> I mean, I do think one thing that's super cool is that even though they're from 14 different countries, have had very different lives, very different experiences, very different backgrounds, there's this uh, way that their love of cooking and feeding others unites them mm. and it's like they're all kind of the same even though they're mm. from like Iran and you know like Japan and uh, Ukraine um, and we actually have a whatsapp group that's awesome and everybody's always wishing each other like happy Diwali mm. happy Eid happy birthday you know and um, it's just I think people really support each other and yeah. love each other's food. And actually, we have a number of instructors who've said that, like, they didn't really try many other cuisines till they joined the League of Kitchens. Mm-hmm. And now they're like, ooh, I love Aiko sushi. Like, Aiko, you bring sushi to our, you know, potluck. Or right. they've really gotten to know each other's cuisines. And that's been cool, too. There's also something really beautiful about how League of Kitchens and your organization has centered women and women's kind of... Uh, ownership and power over cooking in the kitchen and kind of the knowledge and storytelling that comes out of that when I think often the idea of like a woman in a kitchen is denigrated in our culture and really it's something so big and beautiful to be celebrated. Yeah I mean one thing I've come to realize since I started is that really there are two kinds of culinary culture in the world. There's like the royal court food Mm. and then there's like peasant food which is what everybody else eats and that that food those culinary traditions have basically been passed down between generations of women as an oral tradition in the home Mm. like over ten thousand years and i think that because of all the different sort of political social dynamics we know of that has not been really recognized and appreciated and so you know each of our instructors they are really cultural and culinary lineage holders in their community. Mm. Like, I love that term that's from, like, Eastern religion. It's very common, like, Buddhism. Um, you know, like, a lineage holder in a Zen tradition. And it's like they... Actually, uh, Pierre was that. talking about that with the griot. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. And so, like, they are the ones in their communities that, like, are known as the best cooks. And they, they're they really the holders of this knowledge and this expertise. And... I think one of the most exciting things about what we do is like recognizing that as Mm -hmm. being deeply valuable and creating this opportunity for them to share it beyond their immediate family or Mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. But you know, like the story of how I started Leo Kitchens is totally an opposite story (laughs) because um, my Korean grandmother lived with my family when I was growing up. She cooked all of this amazing Korean food all the time. And whenever I'd want to cook with her, she would say, don't worry about cooking, you should go study because studying is more important. Mm -hmm. Which I think is very common in a lot of immigrant families and that was because she didn't really value her own cooking skills Mm -hmm. because they were taken for granted and she really wanted me to have professional educational opportunities that she didn't have Mm -hmm. and would have loved to have had and so she was someone who was sort of like forcibly stuck in the kitchen and so in her mind like the way to get out is to like not learn to cook. How does your mom feel about you? My mom is not into cooking, by the way. <laughs> okay. But is she supportive of yeah. your work? Yes. I mean, I think it's funny because my mom, my mom's actually an artist. So she came as a nurse, mm-hmm. and then she did something very strange for an immigrant nurse, which is she decided to become an artist oh, good and went for her. to an MFA program at the University of Chicago, which was, like, super conceptual, and she randomly ended up there, actually, because she met a Korean woman in a bathroom in Houston, sure. who was a Love professor. <laughs> so she was a nurse in Houston, and this woman, was. they became friends, and her friend was like, do you know Mr. Chicago is a good school? And so she just applied there for graduate school. Oh, my God. Yeah, I and that's it. where she met my you know who Actually, I met, I made a friend on a plane. Is this John, what happened to you? I was just John, here. John is here. He was right oh, there. Yeah. <laughs> we met on the, my flight here on Tuesday. That's John Santos. Anyways. 
It's a very familiar <laughs> yeah. uh, tradition. But so, <laughs> but so my mom, you know, like is not into cooking. My She's the youngest of six. My grandmother told her the same thing. She's like, whatever, do something else. And so she's not interested in cooking at all, though she does cook every night for my dad, which of is course. shocking. And hates, yeah, it's just like, yeah, yeah, she's, she's ambivalent. I wouldn't say she hates it, but she's not interested in right, it. Right, 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 right. And so I do feel like she's perplexed by why I'm so interested in cooking. I do like that my sister is now the Greek chorus of the <laughs> It's great, it's great. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I've been really obsessed with informal economies for many years. This idea that there's, even though there's these, all these super valuable things ha happening that, that are not tracked by traditional mm -hmm. e economic metrics, right? But there's a lot of money and a lot of people making their livings through that. And that's kind of how a lot of mashups, a lot of immigrants mm -hmm. make their hustles happen. Like the lives of our parents and grandparents often exist in that space. And I wondered like how you thought about, you know, in, mm. in connection to this, mm. formalizing uh, something that is and creating an economy around mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. something that has tr traditionally been very uh, informal or yeah. not, you know, not part of an economic system. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a big part of what we're doing because these, you know, it's like moms and grandmas who have never taught cooking before. So none of our instructors have They're taught like, cooking. They're like, just a pinch of this, a <laughs> drop of that. Yeah. yeah, and so we actually do an extensive paid training with everyone mm. we hire to help them kind of transition into being teachers of cooking because often they don't think about why they do stuff. They just do it and they do yeah. it really quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to be like, okay, we're gonna slow down. And like, you know, if people ask you this question, like why, why you know, Des, you know, why do you think like there's red wine vinegar used in Greece? And she's like, I don't know. And then she's like, oh, I think it's because, you know, there's all this wine everywhere that gets turned mm. into vinegar. You know, so it's just like the process of thinking about why they do what they do or use what they do. Um, Wait, so, do you know what? I have an olive tree at my house, okay? That um, I... Wow, it's been a real journey, her olive tree. Okay, yes. <laughs> I'm not going to... There's a lot of geopolitical stuff we can talk about, but uh. the olives started dropping last <laughs> month, okay? And we had never had olives before. And then I looked up how you make olives into something edible, and it's... Oh, so hard, okay? <laughs> and then I was like, how Rebecca could there ever be peace? <laughs> yeah. And then I really went on a symbolic journey, but I but made But you made olives, the best olives. And they're uh, fucking delicious. Yes. And also, every olive you eat should cost $500. Oh yeah, it's so good. Based on it's the so amount good. of labor. Yeah. I was just thinking about all of your colleagues, all of yeah. the women in this world yeah. who are making yeah. freaking delicious right. olives and olive oil and like yeah. how many months and yeah. like putting lye on things. <laughs> I mean like, and hoping you don't poison people <laughs> i mean it's like outrageous anyways so yeah <laughs> pay her I mean, a lot of money to yes. go to these classes well i will say one thing about that it was very important for me when we started that our classes were priced the same as any fancy cooking school in new york city yes yes because it's really a privilege to go to our instructors homes and to learn from them because they are like supreme experts at what they mm -hmm. do and it's no worse or lesser because it's informal because yeah. it was a oral tradition learned from their families than you know some like fancy trained chef. Right? Well, I also think there's this idea that like permeates our brains that as women, as women of color, as immigrants, that like we should just be so fucking grateful all the time <laughs> for the opportunities that are afforded us. And no, it's like yes, there's an opportunity. Yes, I'm going to walk through the door. And also, pay me the money. Yeah. And yeah. you valuing them and establishing that, that that price tag is worth it, it makes everybody believe that it is worth it. Yeah. And yeah. that's I think it's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Um, yes. She's got to yes. <laughs> our, Greek, our Greek chorus Greek. right here, Sandy. Okay, so one question I have for you, what's a surprise ingredient that grows across many cultures that like you could you'd be like, Oh, I'm buying ingredients for everyone. Yeah. I can buy Onion, cilantro, <laughs> cumin. Like, yeah. what's something that you're like, oh, this goes across? Yeah, well, clearly, like, rice. onion, garlic, many kinds of rice, cilantro. Uh, coriander powder is maybe a surprising mm. one. Ooh. A lot of cuisines. You know who has a nice powder. coriander powder? Mm. 
Yeah. We're lapping barrels. Yes, where <laughs> I will also say for the last three years, my holiday gifts to our entire staff and all the instructors has been Burlap and Barrel Gift Certificate. <gasps> so, <laughs> yes, we're all fans. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Again, not sponsored. No. Yes, not yes, we just love them. We so, just love them. Yeah. Um, okay, so a couple more questions before we wrap. What, like, what's your big hope for League of Kitchens? Like, what do you p hope for people to take from the experience, yeah. both the chefs and the guests? Yeah, well, so one of the reasons I decided to start League of Kitchens was, you know, living in New York City, I felt like, okay, we live in this super diverse, amazing place, but there are very few opportunities for meaningful interaction, mm. oftentimes, between immigrants and non-immigrants or between immigrants of different groups. Like, most interactions are service-based. It's like mm. the person at the bodega or the dry cleaner mm. or the waiter at the restaurant. Mm. And so, like, in our workshops, the immigrant is, like, the expert, the host, mm. You're and like the queen of her domain, and you're going into her home. It's very immersive. You meet their families often, and there's this intimacy because there are only six students in each class, and you spend either two and a half hours together or four and a half hours together. And at the end, everybody is hugging. Everybody mm -hmm. feels like the instructor is their new favorite aunt. Um, you know, we've had many students, even like instructors, being like, if you go to Argentina, call me and I'll tell you where to go. And they actually call. Like, yeah. our Argentinian instructor has guided many people on their journeys in <laughs> Wait, Argentina. Wait, what about the people who, the shidduch you did, the people who <laughs> married? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. So we had two people meet at our Lebanese instructor's <gasps> workshop and they got married, <laughs> and she catered their wedding. <gasps> oh. <laughs> right? So I think it's just about Anyways, like- we're just making yes, it up. Yes, you know? it's like humanizing. You can't say that like that. <laughs> We've done a lot of inappropriate. No. Uh, <laughs> but it's like, it creates this opportunity to just humanize people and mm -hmm. different cultures and for like intimate personal connections to be made. And I think particularly for instructors who are from countries where the U.S. has had conflict or have been kind of difficult in past years, like Afghanistan or Iran, like when students go to our Afghan instructor Nuita's home and hear her story and are just like, bowled over by her and her brightness and like her incredible life it doesn't feel so abstract anymore i think when mm -hmm. they read about afghanistan in the news it's like oh that person could be noita's sister mm -hmm. or like right. noita's friend or it just it makes these places that feel very distant and abstract feel personal yeah. and you know i think what more do we want in terms of like creating peace mm -hmm. right is like this kind of deep personal connection understanding and shared you know joy through food like that that's what we want that's what you know every time i hear th stories like that i'm like yes we're doing it yes <laughs> and no. humanizing yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so our final question as we think about wrapping up a meal or wrapping up our conversation is this is cr this is very important is when you are with other asians at dinner <laughs> who pays for the bill <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on how old they are, because um, if it's like my mom or my aunt or like that, mm -hmm. they're going to pay, mm -hmm. right? And it'd be like very insulting for the younger people to try to pay. But I guess if it's peers, I don't know. You don't, okay. I mean, <laughs> I have many tricks, but you know, we'll share them later. I mean, we'll I think, we'll yeah. You yeah. walk to the host stand and hand them yes, the card? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think people obviously like try to pay for each other and like be like, I got this, I got this, and then you fight over it. And, mm -hmm. you know. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a war for dominance, is really what it comes down to. That sounds like yes. Asian diplomacy. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, well, with that, we Thank are so, so grateful much. to you for Aww. coming. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Chatting with you guys. Um, okay, so I'm while Lisa exits, I'm going to introduce. This oh is a small video featuring Amy Choi's mm -hmm. guide to K Town in New York City. Hey, I'm Amy Choi. I am the editorial director and the co founder of the Mashup Americans, and I am here to show you my favorite spots on one of my favorite blocks in New York City, 32nd Street, Koreatown. We are here now at I don't even know how to pronounce it. Tulajou. 
the French bakery in Koreatown. Here they have a baked chocolate green tea donut that is somehow 500 calories and we're gonna get it. Here we have what I would consider to be the more Asian-y section of the Asian bakery. But my favorite is always these curry croquettes. They're like deep fried donuts with savory curry inside of them. I'll get two, a strawberry soft bread. These are my kid's favorite thing on earth. Hi. We're off. This is so good. It makes me so happy. And it's weird because all these things in Koreatown, they're not necessarily things that I had growing up, but to me, this is like my comfort block of New York, and this food is totally part of it. Are we getting a lamia noodle chip mozzarella cheese hot dog? Yes? Too sugar? No sugar. Sweet potato puff potato mozzarella. We'll do the classic. Check out. None of this existed in the 80s or 90s. Like, what's so exciting about the mashup experience is that all of this is being invented all of the time and it's not static. <laughs> but this is a sweet potato covered hot dog. And one thing that I did always grow up eating was baked sweet potatoes, like baked Japanese potatoes, baked Korean potatoes. We would eat them all the time. Me and the crew here are gonna enjoy the rest of these because they're actually so good. And I hope everybody comes and enjoys these in Koreatown. We went to Udi Jeep. It's one of my favorite, favorite, favorite spots for takeout. King is seaweed, pop is rice, and it is uh, seaweed and rice with things inside. This is road trip food. Like there's just like, in the back of any Korean family car, there is children eating king pop. This is chapche. It's sweet potato, like yam noodles, they're clear. It's brown because of the soy and the sesame and all the delicious things. Kimchi fried rice. In Korean, we call it kimchi pokumbap. Pokum is mixed, stir fried, pop, rice, kimchi. I'm always amused when this is like being sold during the day, because to me, this is drunk people food. This is tteokbokki. It's like soft little rice cakes. They can be stir fried in all kinds of ways. These cool young Korean Americans are making these old ass Korean things fresh and delicious and putting them in packaging that is totally irresistible to my elder millennial mind. And this is like, my dream lunch in the middle of Koreatown in New York City. Yay! Hey, we're also working on we're also working on seeing our faces on screen, so that's part of the process. We're all. It's not my face on the screen. It's my face shoving food. You know, it was beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Whew. Well, okay. So our next guest is um, my is somebody who is very expert at putting food in his face. I don't. That's a yeah. weird thing to say. That's a weird thing to say. <laughs> Jake He Cho is the co-founder of Righteous Eats, which highlights incredible eateries, small businesses all around the city, mostly mom and pop, all very, very mashy. And it just uh, brings, he brings joy, like incredible questions and his community with him wherever he goes. It's like an incredible thing to witness. He's one of my favorite followers on the internet. He's also done film, fashion, all kinds of things. He um, speaks beautiful Korean and did my favorite interview ever with BTS. It was part of my journey with Jakey. Welcome. Woo! Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wow. You're not afraid of color. No. Yeah, there's a lot no. of colors going on. Yeah. How's it going, guys? Um, I see like Plantains. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, oh actually. Yeah. Witnessed our beautiful. So, Jennifer uh, uh, of the Green Space made this beautiful flower arrangements everywhere. Melon vase. Mm -hmm. We have a uh, scotch bonnet. Don't touch it. Uh -uh. It's a real peppers and some, some plantains. Scotch bonnet. Yeah. I know. And framing JK yeah. right now, we've got um, a bag of kaktugi. Uh -huh. We've got some masa. Yeah, I see masa. I, I see know. like kimchi. Yeah. 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 We made our dream come true, guys. This yeah. really this really happened. It's our dream ethnic aisle. This is oh, what this happened. This is what we'll be drinking later. Or Eating. Eat, yeah. After. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we can drink could, it too. Yeah, I mean, Wait. Yeah, yeah, you could definitely drink that as well. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Depending on how drunk you are. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. Or we'll just crunch it. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. I will start. So with Righteous Eats, uh -huh. which we love, you highlight these small eateries, every culture, every flavor profile, you really get in there with the owners. And I think that's part of the joy that people 
experience when they're coming along with you for the journey and then you like and then you bring you physically also bring the community with you which is which is like kind of an incredible thing to witness the businesses get like this big lift in in their sales and i think it's just like such a great example of what we're talking about here with building connection and just like breaking down the boundaries that and a lot of the fear i think that comes with like are you doing the right thing are you ordering the right thing will you be able to find something for you at any of these places and you kind of strip away all of that and i love the idea and you say it a lot it's like this was righteous so just can you define with righteous eats like what makes a food righteous what makes a place righteous what makes the experience righteous? wow this is a <laughs> wow this is a multi-layer question that i never actually thought about um <laughs> but first off i just want to say thank you guys so much for having me here um uh, and um yeah when you said that uh, me as you know, the, the, I guess the mascot of Righteous Eats. It's, <laughs> it's definitely a, it's definitely a project and a labor of love that mm -hmm. involves a lot of different people. Um, one of them includes, I think, my executive producer Robert Martinez. He's yeah. here somewhere. Yes, up. Rob. Yeah, yeah, he's right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, that's Rob Martinez. Please give it up for him. Rob and, uh, also does incredible videos which delight me where he practices his Spanish by going up to Spanish speaking vendors and doing the whole conversation and ordering everything. 100%. And it's truly that is something that for somebody who has pretty shit Korean going in and ordering and conversing is hard. I think yeah, it's really yeah. amazing to see. And yeah. uh, my um, our partner Brian who's not here as well. Um yeah, I mean, and we have uh, a number of editors that we also work with. So yeah, I mean, it's definitely a collective um, project. Mm -hmm. So I can't really take full credit for everything that's been going on. And um, when you so graciously said that uh, whenever we visit an eatery, um, we actually drive direct traffic and business to these um, restaurants. I think our batting average is okay. Like we yeah. don't always hit like home <laughs> runs and we're not always like clocking triple doubles each mm -hmm. game, but um, yeah, like for the most part, yeah, we've been able to uh, support and help a lot of eateries, which uh, we I'm very grateful for the community for mm -hmm. showing up. Um, but to answer your question that I feel like is actually very metaphysical, so I don't know <laughs> if I could have a definitive answer for it. It's like what constitutes being righteous, right? Um, I mean, righteousness as a concept, as a form, it's defined by, I mean, everybody has a different barometer and a standard for what is righteous. But for me, um, and I, you know, like for certain religious communities, like if you eat this specific type of protein is considered not righteous, mm -hmm. you know, but right. for me, uh, when I say righteous is, is this something that is authentic? Does it come from a place of love? Mm -hmm. Is it something that I personally find delicious mm -hmm. um, that I could embrace? And even if I might not love it, you know, my palate might not necessarily understand it, mm -hmm. but is it something that I could appreciate? Um, because, you know, like we talked about this before we got on stage, like, yo, don't like yuck someone else's yum. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like we Cardinal don't- Cardinal rule. Yeah, there is yeah. like, for instance, like the first time I ever had a bandeja paisa, which is this Colombian dish. And I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with what it is. It's this gargantuan plate of like heavy carbs, protein, and it's like a slab of pork. And the just vegetables, like the top. their yeah. vegetables is like sliced avocados. Yeah. That's it. You know what I mean? And like maybe a fried. Yeah. A yeah. Fried and yuca yeah. is yeah. like, yeah, yeah. you know, that's what they consider the vegetables and when, and beans, right? So like, you I know, as, so as, as a kid, <laughs> as a kid who had way better metabolism, like, you know, I would say like 15 plus years ago. I was like, holy shit, how do people eat this like <laughs> <laughs> on, on, on a regular basis? But, you know, after consuming it so often, like every few months I crave it. Yeah. It's, it has become a part of my diet. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I'm listening to like salsa at the crib. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm craving bandeja paisa. Like it has become a part of who I am. So initially it might have not been something that I could you know, I, I didn't fully understand, but now I could proudly say that, yo, Ande Abaisa is a righteous dish. Yeah. yeah. You know I mean? Well, I also think the way that you framed up, like you came out here with gratitude, pointed out your partners, 
talked about the community, like all of that is what makes something feel, if not righteous, right. Like yeah. it's like it's an approach to all the work that you're doing, which is. I, I think it has a lot to do with like, you know, my obsession growing up, loving hip hop culture. Mm. Like, it's one music genre that you would hear them shouting out every borough, every city, yeah, like every, area every affiliated yeah. producer, everybody in their block, you know, like, yeah. so yeah, it's kind of like ingrained in me that, yo, whenever I get any sort of praise, I need to shout out to the community. We that actually, have helped I us like a black, there, white, you know Puerto I mean? Rican. Uh, yeah. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> yep. Yeah, um, so wait, quickly, how do you mash up? Like, what are your hyphens? Um, as my cultural identity, you mean? Yeah. Or, or, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I was born in Korea, uh, but I started schooling in China. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, like, in mainstream America for many years, it's like, yo, what's the difference? I mean, we <laughs> obviously know what's the difference here, but, um, yeah, so I was born in Korea. I studied, uh, started schooling in China, and then I landed in this mystical terrain called Queens uh, <laughs> in New York, especially in this, you know, what I call like the modern day Ellis Island, this intersection of Jackson Heights, Elmhurst and Woodside, mm. which, you know, Queens already being this transit community where mm. there's two airports, right? Mm -hmm. So if you are like an immigrant coming into this part of the United States, like you kind of go through you know, mm -hmm. Queens, and before you go to Connecticut and Jersey and Long Island, <laughs> um, you kind of go through Queens, you know what I mean? And um, so I grew up in that intersection where there's just been this hybrid of different cultures and like, you know, my initial image of America as a young adolescent who grew up watching like Disney Channel in like China and Korea mm -hmm. was, you know, white people with blonde hair, that all have like swimming pools in the backyard. <laughs> you know what I mean? That was my image of America. And then I got to Queens and I was like, yo, what are white people like? <laughs> <laughs> like? How come everybody has black and brown hair? And like the only white friends I had were from like these real like countries that were part of the Russian Iron Curtain, right. you know what I mean? Like from Poland, <laughs> you know, like one of the stands, you know what I mean? So, and they all didn't speak English. So we were all trying to figure out what is our American identity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so yeah, I, I identify as Korean American, but I think most importantly, um, I'm a proud resident of Queens, New York. Yeah. 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 You know, we had another Queen of Queens on our previous, uh, our first show in October, Min Jin Lee, the, the immaculate, For perfect sure. yeah. queen of my heart. Yes. And uh, she just also, like, the way she's like, I'm from Queens. Like, when, even when she went to Yale, she was like, fuck you guys, I'm from Queens. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're going to try to make me feel bad? I'm from Queens. Like, right. you don't know anything about human beings. Yeah. Uh, she said it better than that and <laughs> so did you but I, I think maybe that'll be a theme of our season it's just yeah. like queens is the best yes <laughs> i mean no disrespect to the other boroughs i love the other boroughs oh you're yeah, so yeah, diplomatic yeah. but uh but yeah queens is where my heart is yeah, yeah so, so jk what is your oh wow that was interesting where that just went um what is your first food memory um so I have a lot of great fond memories of food, but I think my first memory that I could distinctively remember about food is a bit traumatic. Uh -huh. um, so uh, <clears throat> I could eat mushrooms, all right? I'm not like <laughs> allergic to it or anything, but I don't love mushrooms. And it was because of this mm. particular incident. Mm. So. Um, you know, chapche is this Korean dish, glass noodles. It's something that you usually eat during moments of like celebration. But Rebecca's I think, favorite. It's but, favorite. But I've, but but I've favorite. learned that, you know, non Koreans, when they go to Korean restaurants, they order chapche like yeah. very often. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, you know, I was eating chapche as like this four year old mini J key before the voice got deep and the facial hair <laughs> popped out. Um, you know, and you know, there were like strips of shiitake mushroom that are usually seasoned with some sort of like sesame mm -hmm. oil. And that squiggly, earthy flavor just didn't really sit well with me. So I barfed. <laughs> and ever since then, like mushrooms equals young JK barfing in, in my in my deepest psyche. 
Um, so that's actually my earliest food memory that I could remember very distinctively. Um, that feels like a sad one. But, you know, but I say all this to say, you know, like, I, I, I could appreciate members of the fungi gang. Fungi gang um, but, uh, yeah, like, if I have a choice, I probably wouldn't go for it. You know what I mean? That's fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fair. What about, do you have a favorite food memory? Or, like, what sticks with you as, as an experience that you were like, oh, shit, this is what food can do? The pop um, the, the pandeja? Uh -huh. Well, like... You know, as you have, um, you know, introduced me, uh, I eat a lot. You know what I mean? I kind of, <laughs> I kind of eat for a living now, right? Yeah. So um, when we I, had our call with him, was he drinking a quart of celery juice? I was yeah, drinking you got a cleanse. You gotta just, you got a So literally the day before, I, I went to uh, we we hit up like two vegan restaurants where they fed us incredible amount of di dishes. So I had to like take a day off to just kind of cleanse out the system. <laughs> Um, you know what? Literally, a weird literally almond cheese will, will hurt yourself. Yeah, yeah. So, but one recent food memory that I'm very fond of is um, my neighbors are, uh, they're, they're Mexicans. Mm -hmm. um, specifically New York, Puebla, York. Most, yeah. a lot of them are from Puebla. Right. So, um, you know, uh, his, uh, his, his real name is Jose, but for some reason the whole family calls him Chino. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. And like every time there was like Chino, I thought they were talking about me. Oh, you know yeah. I mean? yeah. Like, no. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, Does he have like small eyes? <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's usually, I don't think I'm he does. I'm just saying that's what Latins I, have. I understand just that. All yeah, a little yeah, yeah. Bit racist. No, 100%. 100%. I, I, I'm very. I have women in my family. Okay? <laughs> yes, I, I understand. Um, it comes from a place of love. You know? it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a word of endearment. I get that. So, yeah, anyways, um, you know. My friend, my Mexican friend, Chino, um, his daughter, his daughter, Abby, uh, recently had a, a, her birthday party and um, it was a celebration and they always have like Sasina and they're grilling stuff up and, you know, the whole family kind of comes together. And um, in my little building that I live in, like me and my lady, we're the only Koreans that live in this building. Everybody else is Mexicans. So like, oh, this is great. it's just yeah. like, a, it's like, it's like we have a quinceanera like literally every month, <laughs> you know. So, um, so yeah. So, so I, I you know, so um, they invited me to come down, and coincidentally, I also had to do this uh, brand deliverable for Coca Cola, mm. and Mexicans love Coca Cola. Uh, um, so I was like, yo, let me just bring boxes and boxes of Coke <laughs> if y'all allow me to shoot content and you know I would love to also enjoy this moment with y'all and you know they were playing like Norteña and just you know grills was popping and you know everybody was speaking all sorts of you know different slang terminologies mm -hmm. from various parts of Mexico and uh, it was just a great moment and how yeah it was it was just something that like you realize there's a lot more similarities than differences. Mm. Yeah. The more you get to literally break bread with people. Yeah. Yep. And um, that you notice um, it's, it, there is a reason why food is the equalizer. Yes. You know, and, I, and I'm very, so that's one memory that I could think about of recent that was very, uh, it kind of like touched me and made me feel appreciated. And hopefully I kind of reciprocated that uh, for them as well. Yeah, that's yeah. beautiful. Do you, um, you know, we talked with Lisa about, you know, hospitality in the home and how she's kind of structured League of Kitchens to allow strangers to come together and experience another person's home and their food and their cooking. How do you think hospitality is different or maybe defined differently if you're going out to an establishment or going into a business and like, you know, because I think what you do and what's so beautiful is that you make the going to a restaurant less transactional and more about meeting and coming together and so like do you think about those two places differently um wow another very uh, <laughs> heavy duty question that i did, don't think i philosophically thought about um but let me try to break this down like as an equation right um when I think of hospitality and, you know, you grew up in a Korean household mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you're from El Salvador um, and I think in a lot of 
were quote unquote third culture kids. We grew up seeing um, certain type of like traits and mannerisms like, you know, when you go to another person's house, you don't go empty handed. Mm -mm. You know what I mean? That's a that's that's taboo. Ugh. Like you're getting slapped <laughs> if you Rebecca's did that. Face you know what I mean? She's like upset. you don't go empty-handed. You you feed the guest until they can't take it anymore. <laughs> um, and it doesn't matter where you are economically to save face. Mm -hmm. Like you fight for the bill. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like mm -hmm. you, you you like the concept of like splitting the bill is like a foreign concept to a lot of our parents. You know what I'm saying? And um, I want to know your strategy. So I do the I do the old like yo I gotta use the bathroom real oh. quick. You know what I mean? Like, you know what yeah. though is that sometimes sometimes people are onto that. So I have found that dining with other Asians, you just call the restaurant in advance and give them your card. Right. That's yeah. That's yeah, an yeah. advanced move. You're yeah, welcome. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So so I think like that's all like ingrained in us mm -hmm. like as part of how we again I don't I'm not saying this is. You know, it's, I don't look at anything as definitives, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if you grew up in a culture that didn't have that as part of your uh, language, I totally, I totally get that as well. But at least that's the language that I grew up accustomed to. So <clears throat> with that said, I think Righteous Eats is essentially an extension of mm -hmm. um, that experience. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you go to another person's house, like these restaurants are their homes, not only mm. their uh, establishments where they conduct business, right? So you go there with the respect that you would give to another person when they go mm. to your house. And also, funny enough, we always fight for the bill because um, to kind of tut our own horn, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> we, we never uh, take free meals for coverage, yeah. you know what I mean? We always pay for the food and nine out of 10 times the owners don't like that <laughs> you yeah. know they they yeah. want us they want to treat us yeah so we do everything within our powers like we've paid deities like yeah. no we don't take your money but if you want to drop something pay the gods I was yeah like, okay cool. so, <laughs> so we paid statues like you know like they're like no your money is no good for us but you know but i was like all right cool i'm gonna take care of your kitchen staff you yeah. know what i mean like so we've done various ways to show our appreciation um to these establishments and through the process um yeah, I, I think that's kind of like a summation of how we express um, our appreciation. Yeah. And I think at the end of it all, it's like, you know, that's what hospitality is, yeah. right? I mean, I think and I could be completely wrong, but I think the root word of like hospitality is what like the Greek word is about hope is, I think. Uh, it, mm -hmm. it means to greet and host mm -hmm. or to guest and host. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yo, we're constantly trying to... Um, be good host yeah and also be respectable respectful guests yeah you know what i mean i do oh, think it's so extreme so important we come from a very extreme I mean, hospitality she was at my house in los angeles this past weekend my mom came to my house and brought, brought her a bracelet yes <laughs> like it was just like well you need a gift like we we or we were in el salvador this summer as our families and the way that my aunts and uncles are like oh i'm now in the whatsapp group yeah the whatsapp I'm group and then like oh you mm -hmm. liked this basket oh we're gonna set make sure you see when all the other ones appear and mm -hmm. we're gonna feed you and oh you liked pollo campero oh well we had it three times yeah in two days. and like <laughs> and like every box of it and you you know so that there's just a commit like a sense of caring what matters to people like and holding them which yeah. to me yeah. it's actually uh i i appreciate how generous and diplomatic you were about like people not being like that but it's actually a very shocking hard thing for me to adjust to yeah when people aren't because it's so much a part of everything i know of how to be like yeah. you just you 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 we always do this in our just like take people well, in. just just like, they, hold just on, into, whoop, yeah. you just like, <laughs> whoop, you know, like people become family right, and that's right. how you operate in the world. And For I sure. also think, yeah. and I will toot Righteous's horn also, yes. is that um, when we offered Jakey an honorarium to come be here with us tonight for your time, because as previously explained, we believe in paying people for their time, that you said, you know what? I will take this money and I'm going to use it to fund the vouchers that we will give to our community and our fans to go visit these restaurants. And I think that that's just like, again, this thoroughness and this extension of your work is what people feel even if they don't know all the details. Yeah, um, thank you for addressing that. I mean, you know, 
I, I'm not sitting on like hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars <laughs> by no means. Um, Two hundred and fifty dollars are very is very valuable for me as as it is for many people. But uh, we have this ongoing voucher program which we started. I think Rob, we're like what like restaurant fifteen now. Yeah, around that. So we've been um, giving out ten twenty twenty five dollar vouchers for the ten first ten people that visit these eateries and also uh, shout them out via social media. And uh, you know, when you said the honorarium is two hundred and fifty dollars, I was like, oh, that's perfect. Like, yeah. yeah, like we could just go put that right back into our voucher program. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so you know, we've been talking about the ethnic aisle a little and the ways that. We're super interested and kind of invested in the ways things get categorized. Like when we started the Mashup Americans and, and ma started our website, we we're like, we don't want it to be like Asian, you know, Jewish, black, what, whatever. It was about pop culture, food, issues, you know, <laughs> issues is like where, you know, all of it is issues. It is all and, issues. Um, and, you know, family, et cetera. And then, so I was curious, you know, but obviously the, the specifics of all of them are very important, but we thought about the mixing them up. You know, if you have you have food as the category, but within it you can tag things specifically, and the stories are specific. Uh, but I would just like if you could categorize New York City small food businesses, restaurants, not by nation of origin, but like some other category. Mm. How might you do it? Like a bread, rice, fried, spicy, like <laughs> stuffed. Wow, these are. Wow, these are like some engineering. <laughs> these are questions for like engineers, like no, where they have to develop an app. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. how do you categorize? Well, what verticals do they fall into? Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, oh man, that's that's wow. That's a tough one because um, right now the easiest one is like ethnic, you know, cultural backgrounds. But right. yeah, like I mean. I would have to get back to you on that. I, 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 don't, I, don't I would a, say food you, foods you can eat with your hands. That's right? a good one. Maybe you could yeah. do it by utensil type. Mm. Yes. Spice level. Yes, yes. Rice-based. Rice-based. Yeah, based. yeah, yeah. I think like rice-based. Noodles. Based. Yeah, Acidic. but you know what it is, though? Like, again, like, this is, you know, through our... And it, and it, it and it's not even like we've been traveling the world, right? Like, right. even within New York City... Uh, you get to try so many different uh, types of food, right? Yeah. I think the estimate, I think pre-pandemic, they were saying that within uh, the tri-states of New York, like you could try about 120 different uh, food from 120 different countries, mm. like if you made the effort. Mm -hmm. um, so that alone, we were able to get exposed to so many different cuisines. And throughout the process, um, I found out there's so many different types of rice dishes mm. and so many similarities that with the, you know even within the rice dishes right so for instance there's a, a Senegalese dish called jebujen um, where it's uh, it's a plate with uh, rice and um, some form of a fish stew and um, vegetables and they use this crispy, you know, like in the pot, there's that crispy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like rice in the bottom. Oh, like in Iranian, like in exactly. So oh, Koreans call that nurungji, mm -hmm. right? So this the Senegalese uh, gentleman, the owner, was so proud that yo, this is like this crispy rice. You know, we eat this. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> have you seen this before? And I was like, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know what I mean? So I was like, wow, like. And, you know, I didn't want to like tell him that yo, like, I actually grew up eating this too, but because he was so excited that he was putting me onto something that was like completely new, so I was like, yeah, you know, like I, I, I kind of have an idea of what it is, you know what I mean? But, but you know, even that alone is yeah. like, wow, like so many different cultures have rice dishes, and there are similarities, and there are like a through line within those dishes. So, oh my God, what if we made a book that was just like. Rice dishes with crunchy bottoms. Like, yes. I would absolutely, that's the most delicious rice dish. Yeah, no, 100%. I don't know what the first week numbers are going to be for that book, but. You well, know, we're going to make it happen. It's print yeah, on yeah, demand. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's an ebook. It's right, digital. Right, 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 for sure. We'll just text people. You know who yeah. has delicious. Oh, sorry. Senegalese food? Taranga. Yeah. Shout out to Taranga. Everybody should go yeah. eat some Taranga. Yeah. Um, okay. 
We have a business proposal. Yes. Um, we learned that we know from I your prolific that this social was like media. A pitch demolition. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we, Burlap you and know Barrel what? was telling us about the guys were telling us about when they went on Shark Tank. Uh -huh. and so surprise, oh, yeah. <laughs> Mark Cuban is here. I oh, know. No, we learned. Um, it's we worked on a project for Warrior, which is the uh, the show that was developed for by Bruce Lee and recently came into existence. And there's um oh. Ching, ching. Opa. There's um, a line that one of the characters says that when you have a window of opportunity, you take it. You take it. Yeah. Right. It's a fucking window of opportunity. And so anyway, we have a business proposal, mm -hmm. which is that um, many of our favorite foods get stuck in our teeth, mm -hmm. particularly oxtail and oxtail. any sorts of beef. We oh, love right. oxtail. That is true. Yeah, mm -hmm. we love oxtail. Yes. We, we love, love oxtail. And oxtail. Why, why is it so good? Why, can you help mm -hmm. me understand why I love it so much? I think it's the, scar the scarcity. Mm. You know what I mean? It's the scarcity that, you know, like every culture that you go to, I mean, you know, maybe like in America's critical mass, like they haven't fully discovered the beauty of oxtail yet. Yeah. But if you're from the Caribbean islands, if you're from, you know, South Korea, mm -hmm. like if you're from, you know, like Latin America, oxtail is like that special item oh, that you could so never good. have enough. And the price point for yo ox inflation has been hitting numbers and yo I like, know. oxtails <laughs> the chart is going you know what I mean it's so I think I, I I think the assumption is also the fact that we don't get to have it as often oh, mm -hmm. you know what I mean because if it was like flank steak you know what I mean like yeah it's, it's whatever well <laughs> but it's also like the cartilage at the end right oh my god but the other thing about it is. It it's really stuck gets in stuck teeth. in your teeth. It does, yeah. <laughs> and what? So what? One proposal we wanted to make is: should we do uh, righteous eats mashup X. floss uh, collab? <laughs> like, or those little what? I don't and know about your dad, but the toothpicks that would like were all stuck together, you know, and they'd like peel peel off the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like should we with do the mint flavors? The, the oh, mint no, so flavors I think we need or like cinnamon? A toothpick with longevity. Yeah, because you need to have the you know gotta be there for a while so, so we're just we, wondering if you want to start a collab with us on i'm actually i'm actually very interested thank yes. you <laughs> <laughs> we did it <laughs> i'm actually very interested yes our first cpg approach <laughs> is gonna be floss with the mash of americans you know what I, it's elegant it's it, elegance yes uh, definitely it's, it's gonna I, be I don't i don't know if amy and i would agree when we see a korean gentleman rubbing his belly and, and, and having a, no but you gotta if you put your there, hand in front of your mouth oh, it's you can't see anything nobody knows it's incognito yes nobody knows yes oh my god no. <laughs> wow deep cuts here okay um i think that's it jakey thank you for having oh me. my god yeah. thank you so Appreciate much for you. being here thank you guys all for pulling up as well wait yeah. Shout also out to you guys. we have to say what do we say bong Bong. Right, righteous. I mean, Bong. I really gotta give credit to the RZA bong. from the Wu Tang Clan. Of always, you know. But he says Bong Bong. I say Bong. You know, I okay. simplify. Oh. <laughs> All right, well we got the same but different. Yes. Okay. Shout out to the RZA. Always. Yes. Always. Always. Um, Wu Tang thank you. forever. Wu Tang. It's, it's for, for the, the children. children. Yes. Um, that is it from us tonight. But as the artists in residence at WNYC's Green Space, we have one more event. December sixth, we are creating the Mashup American Book Fair. We will have a curated bookstore of all of our favorite titles. We will have author talks all day. Rebecca, yes. would you oh, like we're to share? Hear from Jacqueline Woodson, uh, Jeff Chang, Eric Kim, Vashti Harrison, and Julia Stiles can do some performances for mm -hmm. us. Uh, tickets are available now on thegreenspace.org. And our new season of The Mash of Americans is out now. Uh, we have an episode this week with the brilliant, beautiful human Jeff Chang, who will also be here in person wow. December Shout 6th. Shout out to Jeff. Shout out to Jeff. Jeff. You know, he's a hip hop historian, one of the most beautiful books, Can't Stop Own Stuff. Mm -hmm. And we have a crush on him. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much to Lisa Kyung Gross and Jakey Choi. Yes, and thank you to the incredible team at the Green Space Jennifer, Ryan, Amber, Ricardo, Kate, Christina, Eric, Chase, Liv, and Dalila. Thank you to Taranga, Chat Dog, Chandra, and Damira from oh, League of Kitchens, Not Chickens, Ooh. and Burlap and Barrel in Harlem Ooh. Blue. And feel uh -huh. free to come up and take pictures with our with ethnic aisle if you'd like. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.